Okay, you've seen the title. Today we're talking about Spy Kids. You know, the hit early 2000s trilogy about kids doing spy things. We don't we don't talk about this one. I wasn't even conscious yet when these movies were coming out, but I do remember watching Spy Kids 3 a few years after its initial release. And let me tell you, this movie was the blueprint. It was Sword Art Online before Sword Art Online. You know I'm lying. It was even better. Spy Kids 3 was revolutionary. Spy Kids 3, um wasn't even about spies. Or at least I can barely remember a single time where like the spy aspect was actually important to the plot, at least in the last movie. I'm just mentioning it today since that's the last time something with the word spy in the title got my attention. I swear as kids were sold on a lot of ideas. The example everyone loves to give is good old quicksand. Shows back when I was a kid had me convinced that I had to be ready every day for this Looney Tune type of danger. Another idea that they always tried to sell us that I actually didn't buy into this time was how cool spies were. Like bro these guys are just glorified government workers. Sure they got cool equipment and skills but compare spies to something like Saiyans and ask a young me which one is cooler. So when I seen a story titled Spy X Family drop on my favorite manga reading app, the Shonen Jump app, please for the love of god sponsor me, I just went back to reading my other Shonen series. It wasn't until I heard that Spy Family was getting an anime adaptation that I picked it up, which I'm realizing now is a common theme in most of the new manga I read. But yeah, I, I enjoyed it. End of video, Bye bye Today I wanted to take a dive into what makes Spy Family different, or as the title of the video suggests, how Spy Family is reviving a dead genre. What's that dead genre you ask? Surely it has to be the spy genre, right? I mean maybe, probably, but my main focus today is how Spy Family is bringing back the family comedy genre. I know there's at least one guy in my comments already typing about how that's a lie, the family comedy genre never died. While it's true that there are quite a few family oriented anime out there, these are often only mainstream or legacy stories in Japan, you never see them transfer over well internationally for reasons that we can look at in another video. But if you just want a little proof anyways, ask anyone in the west what's the longest airing anime and you'll hear them probably say this one instead of these two. What makes Spy Family even more interesting though is how it's publishing in the biggest and most mainstream shown in magazine out there, which is targeted at a demographic that I at least expect to brush over anything with the word family in it. Think about how Takamichi's parents and most of their parents in a shonen anime like Tokyo Revengers aren't even mentioned once and we all kind of just accept that. The family aspect of shonen stories anyways usually just boil down to these aren't my friends, they're family cliche. While other big shonen titles like Full Metal Alchemist or Jojo's might have the family aspect be an important part of the plot, the dynamics that exist within the family are very very rarely ever the focus of these types of stories. I don't think we've seen a healthy family anime dynamic in so long that people that are chronically online have kind of forgotten what that looks like. That's not to say that Spy Family is purely about this family aspect either, it's real interesting parts actually revolve around the spy stakes in the story instead, as you would probably expect. Yet family brings a whole new and unique dimension to keeping the story interesting, which we'll soon see. With the anime just starting to air, I'm keeping the rest of this video spoiler free from anything far ahead in the manga. I'm only focusing on the first two chapters today, which is exactly the first two episodes of the anime. I picked this point specifically because it's only then that we're introduced to the entire main family. Hopefully through what I'm about to say next, you gain a new appreciation for Spy Family if you're already a fan, or maybe you now consider picking it up to watch or read, especially if you're like me and was never really into spies in the first place. So. Back to the family comedy genre. You remember it, it's a thing of the past for most of us now, but there was once a time where the whole family might have gathered around the TV to watch everyone's favorite show. Although you might not have realized it when you were younger, it takes a certain type of skill to be able to craft these types of stories considering how wide the target audience is. You have to make a story that people at drastically different points in their lives can all enjoy. Of course, as I just mentioned, Spy Family isn't purely just made of this family or comedy genres. As with most great stories, they blend multiple genres together to create a unique feeling when you're watching it. I noticed an emphasis on this blend a bit more when I started watching the anime adaptation. In my mind, when first reading the manga, I expected goofy spy noises every time something happened like, like this. <laughs> And that's mainly because that's what I've grown to expect when you mix the spy and comedy genres together. Yet you learn quickly in the anime and a tiny bit later in the manga that this is not the feeling that Spy Family ends up creating. But still, what makes the family aspect of Spy Family great? To me it's not how it revolves around the usual wholesomeness or comical atmosphere that can exist in a family, but more on how it plays on this idea of deception and lies under one roof. The story very much opens with these feelings. 
Everyone has a secret self they don't show to other people. Not to friends, not to lovers, not even to family. They hide who they are and what they want behind lies and painted smiles. And thus the world maintains this thin veneer. I don't even know what that word means. Sounds like something Shakespeare would say. Anyways, and thus the world maintains its thin veneer of peace. In this panel, we're first introduced to the family. The father, a spy, the mother, an assassin, and the daughter, we learn very quickly, is a telepath. Deception here involves not just the father's spy work, as the spy family title might suggest, but each of these family members hiding their identities from each other while continuing to play their family roles. In that sense, much of what keeps the story interesting is simply just the possibility of someone finding out about someone else's true identity. And that's not even me analyzing the story. If you see Spy Family's creator, Tatsuya Endo's author, author's note in the first volume of the series. Let me let me get to that. One second. All right, here we go. He says, I'm a big fan of movies and anime where the characters are hiding who they really are. I love the tension of will they be discovered and the anguish of them wanting to reveal their secrets, not being able to. There isn't any of that in this manga, but I hope you'll enjoy it anyways, which is his own way of trying to deceive us. Now for each of these three main family members introduced by Endo and Spy Family, let's go a bit more in depth into who each member actually is, how their existences fuel the themes of deception and lies in the story, and how the dynamics that they have in the family relate back to the family comedy genre. Starting off with the first character that we're introduced to, please focus. Come on, come on. This guy. The father. Lloyd, codename Twilight. We're given news that an impeding war between two nations is bound to happen and the only way to maintain peace might just be by calling him Twilight, this organization's greatest spy. We cut to a shot of a man asking Twilight if he secured a super secret document for him that could threaten world peace. He hands over the document and walks away like any cool looking spy, but then a guy that looks exactly like the dude he just handed a document over to asks for the super secret document again. Yeah, it turns out the first guy was actually just disguised as the real guy he needed to hand the document over to. Who's this mysterious dress up artist that just secured the super secret document to maintain world peace? You guessed it, the real Twilight. This is of course minor, but Twilight's entrance redirection here, where we're first introduced to a spy that ends up not even being him, instills these feelings of deception very early on, at least if you're focused. If you missed this cue, which I also did the first time reading it, Endo makes this theme of deception that carries on throughout the story even clear when he says that Twilight was a veteran of the battlefield, employing a hundred different faces to survive. Faces here of course referring to the disguises he uses to deceive. We see him then strain his hair and put on some glasses to play his next role, the boyfriend of the daughter he just stole the documents from. Redirection is something Endo loves to use in the story, and you could probably spot it at least five times in a single chapter, but mostly just for foreshadowing, which we will see again. When Twilight ends up going to dump the daughter of the guy he just stole the documents from after he got all the intel he needed, we see a shot of him explaining that he could never have hopes of anything more. You know, an actual relationship, marriage, an ordinary life, family. He gave that all up when he decided to become a spy. And as you probably now expect, Everything Twilight just said was foreshadowing. His next mission that he gets as a spy is to start a family. Turns out the biggest threat to world peace right now is a man that Twilight has to get close to. Donovan Desmond. Terrifying looking guy. Cool name. If Twilight can get in his circle of friends, he might just be able to persuade him to be more of a pacifist or something like that. The only problem here is that this guy is very careful of who he's around. The only times you ever see him out in public are at events for his son's elite private school. So Twilight needs to find a child to get into this elite private school so he can get close to Desmond at events, but he also needs to find a wife to get into so that he can keep the image of a normal family to avoid suspicions of being a spy, and also because this is a discriminatory private school that won't accept broken up families. Sounds like a private school to me. Keep in mind everything that I've just explained happens in only the first two minutes of the story, which shows just how strong Spy Family's introduction is. But anyways, here we are. The beginning of the family. A very fake family, but a family nonetheless. Twilight takes up the name Lloyd Forger. Get it? Forger? Forger? He's forging his idea. Lloyd then goes on his first side quest. Find a kid for the bigger mission. The kid that he finds is of course everyone's favorite cute child this anime season. Anya. Codename... 
Anya. Thought it was supposed to be pronounced Anaya when I first read it, so if I slip up when talking, ignore that. We hear that she gets adopted and then dropped again, which at first doesn't seem like it strikes a chord in Lloyd's cold spy heart until his informant, friend, and my favorite character in the story, Frankie, tells him that she's a lot like him, a person of many names, which forms a sort of connection between them. Yet both Frankie and Lloyd are clueless about Anaya's element of deception. As a result of lab experiments, did I say Anaya? Anya. Anya. Let me redo that. Yet both Frankie and Lloyd are clueless about Anya's element of deception. As a result of lab experiments, Anya became a telepath. She can read everyone's minds. And this is where things start to get a bit interesting. She's like us in the sense that she's the only character to know the truth about the other characters in the story. She knows her adopted father is a spy because she can read his mind. She knows her adopted mother is an assassin, you get the idea. Other characters are blind. She knows everything, just like our place when reading the story. I guess you can also say Anya is kind of like the embodiment of dramatic irony. If you weren't paying attention in your English class, it's basically when the audience watching the show knows something in the story that other characters don't. It's often used for comedic purposes. She might be a character in the story herself, but her mind reading powers basically turn her into an audience member as well, since she knows just as much as us again, at least when it comes to what the other characters are thinking. However, this isn't even the extent of her telepathic powers either. When looking at the good old family comedy genre again, her telepathic powers also allows the story to play on one of the genre's cliches. The cliche that kids know more than their parents think that they know, which is often also a very real life scenario. It's like when your parents try to hide something from you when you're young, yet they don't know that you already know about it. Anya's character constantly lives through the scenario, which makes for some pretty funny scenes too. Like when Lloyd is trying to save her from a hostage event, he says, we're just playing tag, ha 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 ha, and she hits him with the, daddy is a liar. This cliche also appears to be a motivating factor for Anya in a sense. She knows exactly just how much the success of Lloyd's mission, and in turn world peace relies on her getting into that elite private school, so she tries extra hard. It's time for a sob story. All of, all of that just reminded me of when I was a kid trying to get the highest grades possible to not only impress my parents, but because I knew that doing well in a good school was one of the main reasons they moved to a whole new country. Until I realized that no matter how good I did, they would always want higher. Then I started doing even better in school out of pure spite. Hope you, hope you enjoyed the trauma dump. Anyways, point is, Anya's character serves as the adorable funny kid everyone loves in any show under the family comedy genre. She's there to be herself, try her best, and do anything to make both of her parents proud. Speaking of both her parents, let's get to that second parent now. Your codename, Mommy, sorry, sorry, Thorn Princess, Lloyd's fake wife, and Anya's fake mother. We learn from the beginning that Yor is a bit of an outcast among her bitch-ass co-workers. In fact, the only person we see Yor close to is her brother. Both her co-workers and brother, however, seem to be wary about Yor being single at 27 years old. It might seem suspicious, in other words, it might seem like she's a spy or something, if she lives alone at this age, at least in the eyes of the society that they live in. Of course, we learn soon after that she's also a whole part-time assassin trying to maintain the peace between the two nations in the story too, which is an identity that's obviously harder to hide when you clearly aren't trying to build something like a family. Recall that Lloyd needed a woman to act as Anaya's Anaya. I keep saying Anaya. Recall that Lloyd needed a woman to act as Anya's mother for the elite private school selection process, and now we see that Yor needs a boyfriend to cover up her act too. So naturally, when they both run into each other, you you know what happens next. The family is finally assembled. Now, Yor's place in the family comedy aspect of Spy Family is quite subtle. She plays the person trying to fit in the most, not just as the last addition in the family, but just as a person in society. It's her twisted inner monologue relating to this idea that brings a bit of comedy. <laughs> like when she's debating whether to ask out Lloyd, but then she sees Anya and thinks he's already married. She thinks to herself, man, I, I can't go after him now. I've heard many stories about wives murdering the other woman, but I guess in my case I would murder them first. Comedy. Point is, she thinks how something would look in the eyes of society before doing it. On a certain level, we all do this, and especially Lloyd trying to hide his true spy identity, but considering Yor's context here is interesting. She's completely fine with assassinations because she believes it's for a good cause, like preventing further conflicts and supporting her brother financially, even if to society those actions could likely be judged more than the intent. Her desire to fit in is in direct conflict with what she actually does, which leads to her own reasons to deceive everyone. It's also a bit ironic 
ironic how Yor wants to be as normal as possible, but her immediate solution to every problem is still murder, regardless of circumstances. Like when one of her coworkers threatens to tell her brother that she lied about having a boyfriend, this girl says, well, I can make sure my brother doesn't know if everyone here were to, uh, disappear. My type of crazy. However, the way Yor reacts to Lloyd's kindness, how she tries to help her brother and genuinely play the good stepmother role for Anya, counteracts this murderous aura we see when first introduced to her, but this is something that's only emphasized later on. What should be clear here is that Yora trying to fit in with Lloyd and Anya throughout the story is where a lot of the fun comes from. There's one scene involving them and a certain short hair character that we meet later on that I can't wait to see animated, but I don't want to spoil any more than that. On that note, let's get back to Lloyd real quick. One thing I can only talk about now after introducing Anya and Yor is the disconnect between Lloyd's work and his place in the family. It's the stereotype that fathers are absent or always more focused on their work. You know, you know the Kanye line. Of course in Lloyd's case, we know this isn't his real family or anything, but that doesn't stop the plot from playing on the stereotype as the family genre often does. Much more of the family comedy in the show comes from Lloyd trying to be a good dad to Anya despite the fact that she's only his daughter for this mission. In fact, he repeatedly says I shouldn't care so much about this kid because I'm sending her right back to the orphanage after this mission, yet he buys parenting books and when she gets kidnapped, he recklessly goes to save her even though he knows he can just find a new kid and restart the mission. This determination and protectiveness is something we see Anya look up to, which makes us smile. One could also see this as great kindness, which is something we see your greatly appreciate. In all, as dysfunctional as this family gets, you might see flashes of your own or pieces of what you would like yours to look like one day, and that's where the beauty of Spy Family comes from. It does what the family comedy genre once did best, show that a family isn't a place where lies or deceptions don't exist, it's where everyone briefly puts that individuality aside to connect and feel like they're part of a home, or something along those lines. That about wraps up the character profiles for each member in the Forger family for now. If you stayed up to this point in this video, first, thank you so much. Second, I'm sure you'll love everything that's going to happen next in Spy Family, so definitely keep up with it this spring anime season. Since Dr. Stone ended, Spy Family is actually just one of two manga I'm still keeping up with in the Shonen Jump line, with the other being Blue Box. I'm reading a lot of other manga though, and ever since I deleted TikTok, I actually got the attention span to watch anime again, so I'm looking forward to these next four months. For those that don't already know, I took the whole summer off. No work, no school, for the first time in like four years, all just to put 100% of my focus on these longer YouTube videos and hopefully get the ball rolling to make something out of this. If I can't, then I'll obviously keep making videos, but only part time again. So if you enjoyed, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe, share with a friend, and feel free to also drop what anime, manga, or movie you would like to see me talk about next in the comment section. I finished Sweat and Soap in like two days last week, and I was thinking of maybe talking about that, but I'm sure most of you would probably want to see me talk about something else. In the works, I was also thinking about a video on anime movies in 2022, a video on Fujimoto's one shots, another Shinkai video, and a video on my top two manga of all time, Real and Vinland Saga. I guess I'll see you a lot more this summer. Until the next one, this has been Thoughts from Shivam. Peace out.